and we'll do this again. Welcome. I, I'm Gail Peterson. I'm the program director for the Oxford Social Finance Program. We appreciate you joining us today. And uh, Alex Nichols, my colleague and um, uh, faculty director for the uh, Social Finance Program, and our dean, Peter Tafano, has also joined us. Today, we're really going to talk about and have a conversation uh, with, with Peter, uh, with myself, and Alex to really talk about what is social finance? Why is Saeed Business School involved? Why now? What will students learn? How will we learn who our faculty and students are and what our goals are? When you leave Saeed Business School after social finance, what will you take with you and the benefits that will our community will gain? We'll open the, the conversation up for your questions and then also talk about how you can join us. So we look forward to the conversation. We have colleagues from around the world. I think 38 countries represented and more than 350 people signed up for this webinar. So thank you again for joining us. As I said, I wanted to introduce and welcome um, Alex Nichols, our academic director. Alex has a long, illustrious career in social entrepreneurship and is recognized leader in the field of social finance, impact investing, and social impact bonds. My research as associate fellow at Site Business School is really focused on the intersection of social finance and blending capital through in a philanthropy, impact investing, and corporate finance. And uh, a dean of the business school, uh, Peter Tafano, his own research has been focused on consumer finance and finance innovation, and is also founder of Commonwealth, a nonprofit social enterprise. So you'll hear from the three of us today about what we see social finance offering to our students and why we think it's important. I think it's, again, it grounds you in what we offer, and I'd like to turn that over to uh, Peter and to Alex to talk about our research and also your um, your perceptions on why social finance is being offered now and what we hope students will learn. So Peter, do you want to go first? Sure, happy to. So hello to everyone. This is Peter Tomano. I'm sitting here in, in lovely Oxford today. Could be a little bit brighter, but otherwise I uh, wish you were here with us. Uh, so I'll just give you my perspectives. Uh, before becoming a dean, I've been a finance professor for about uh, a quarter of a century or, or, what, or about theirs. Um, and my work in finance, I looked at financial institutions and financial intermediaries and how big financial systems work. I looked at corporate financial engineering, financial engineering more generally. And I have always been a huge believer in the power of finance to direct resources in, in its best way to improve the state of the world. Um, and we normally think about capital markets as being the, the channel through which money flows from people who have it to those who need it in order to do big projects. It's one of the key, four key functions of finance. Um, and so this can, this can work really, really well with large mega projects. It can work well with large corporate projects. But it turns out that there are many other things that need to be accomplished in the world. They're going to be accomplished not only through governments or not through large corporations, but through other kinds of enterprises. Um, and so my perspective as dean then is very much colored by that. So if we began with a bit of a case study, imagine that the problem at hand was how do you solve the, the issue of having inadequate electric power in Africa? Um, you know, if you fly over the continent of Africa in the evening, you'll see that it's dark. And the reason it's dark is there's not, elect not, ele not enough electric power there. Economists have estimated that the cost of the lack of electric power in Africa can be, you know, 1 to 2% deterioration of GDP per year, which is a massive amount. And there's lots of other statistics one could throw at it. So how do you solve that problem? It might be through social enterprises. It might be through large uh, corporations. It might be through mega projects. Um, but whichever solution you provide, you're going to have to make sure that the capital flows appropriately to those places in order to affect change, change that both will improve the, the, you know, the, well, the well-being of the people who live in the continent and also the change that will be the kind that whatever type of organization, a social enterprise, a corporation, a mega project, or a government can, uh, can make work within their institutional boundaries. So what's social finance then, and how does it fit in the school? From my perspective, it is you know, the extraordinarily exciting developments that are taking place right now 
where more and more money is being deployed in more and more interesting ways to solve some of the most uh, intractable, if not intractable, certainly difficult problems in the world. And Gail and Alex can talk about the details. But in my mind, you know, what started as philanthropy um, has now expanded far beyond that. And social finance includes all the ways that money flow, in my mind at least, all the way that, that money flows from kind of people who have it to the people who need it in order to affect change. Now, my vision of social finance is perhaps a bit larger because you know, the work that I do in household finance or consumer finance also considers financial markets and financial institutions and financial systems as a route to, as a route to social change more generally. The work that I do personally, and if you want, Gail, we can talk about that later, is about how to change financial systems in order to help low-income families to better manage their money, to take care of their daily needs, to take care of their longer, medium to long-term needs uh, for themselves and for their families. So in my mind, the social finance that we do at the business school is part of this, this broader mission. Um, why Saeed and why now? Um, why Saeed? Oxford Saeed, uh, we pri at Oxford Said, we pride ourselves in talking about being a world-class business school community embedded in a world-class university tackling world-scale problems. And I'd like to focus on the last part of that trio, tackling world-scale problems. What does it mean for a business school to actually care about the big problems of the world and see if they can do something about them? Well, I mean, one model would simply be train people in whatever field and they'll go off and make money and somehow indirectly they will achieve good. And of course, that's part of our mission. But the other part of the mission is a little bit more direct, which is how is it that we specifically orient some of the research that we do, some of the teaching that we do, some of the engagement activities we do, so that we can be uh, an even more effective instrument for social change. Uh, so that's part of uh, the mission of the school. Uh, and if you were to walk around the school on virtually every whiteboard in, in the building, you'll see this slogan uh, or motto expressed. Um, so that's why Oxford say why now? I think the time is right. Uh, financial techniques have been improved. Metrics have been improved. There's data available now that was never available before that allows new uh, investors to think about putting their money to work in ways that they hadn't thought about before. Um, maybe the only upside of the great imbalance of uh, wealth inequality that we're seeing in the world is that there are some folks with massive amounts of money who are then trying to figure out the best ways to deploy it in order to improve the world that they live in. Um, and in that world, perhaps, uh, you know, having a program like social finance, which can help to create a channel or at least the logic for a channel, again, between people who have considerable amounts of wealth and or institutions that do, and the problems that need to be solved uh, seems to be the absolute right thing to do here at the school, and this seems to be the right time to do it. So maybe I'll stop there, but that gives you some thoughts from my perspective as dean and as a finance professor uh, and as a social entrepreneur, how all this fits together. Thank you, Peter. And, and again, we're pleased that you're going to be one of our faculty members on, our, on the social finance program. Alex, you've been a leader in this field a while, and, and, and needless to say, you've got your, your, your cover of your book uh, front and center right now. Talk about what you think the, your vision is for, what's your vision for social finance, and why now? Why is it important now? Okay, thank you, Gail. I hope you can hear me. It's Alex Nichols here, Professor of Social Entrepreneurship, and I, uh, I concur with, uh, with pretty much all that Peter says, but I, I might add just a couple of things beyond that. And, Really, this comes out of the fact that uh, our work in this area has been uh, focused from within the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship, which some of you may know is a, uh, a research and teaching and practice center at the business school that's been in place now for 14 years. So we've had a long time to think about um, how entrepreneurship and innovation can uh, address big social and environmental problems. And, you know, about 10 years ago, we realized that um, rather than focusing solely, as people tended to do it though, in those days, on the innovations themselves, it was going to be critical to look at how they were financed. Um, because if you wanted to scale or even start up innovations to address big problems, resources were going to be critical. And this is what we heard all the time from the field, too. So it presented both a practical and an academic and theoretical challenge to think about what this new finance might look like that's focused on impact primarily. 
as it happened at the same time, uh, institutions of practice were emerging too, new intermediaries, new government policies around the world, new instruments for directing capital to impact were beginning to emerge. So it was a kind of sweet moment as we came to our own realization about the importance of social finance, that the field was also moving in this direction. Now, but one thing I would, um, I'd probably add to Peter's comments with respect to social finance and its purpose and um, evolution is that it's in common with social entrepreneurship, at least partly a response to the failure of the status quo. So it's, um, it's disruptive. It's not simply saying that all we need to do is to take the existing tools of finance and somehow repurpose them or redirect them towards creating uh, not just financial return, but other forms of value. It's to say that there are fundamental problems with the existing financial system and those need to be changed. And so in that sense, social finance is a, at least in parts, uh, you know, a revolutionary idea. And I think that's entirely appropriate faced with the, the abject failure of the status quo to address many of the big problems that we have in the world today. So given the, the institutions of the world have struggled to deal with climate change or mass migration or pandemics, water shortages and so on, and that every, everything that the year has taught us so far is that these problems are going to get worse in the conventional institutions of the world, if you think of the politics of the world at the moment being very problematic, then the chance to, to offer a different narrative, a different set of institutions and structures to try to tackle big problems seems to be something we should all be grasping. So social finance, I think, takes the, the, um, the opportunities that, that financial markets present and tries to retool them to address these big problems that are not being addressed by existing systems. So in terms of what that means, and this has been touched on already, uh, the, and what makes social finance, I think, distinctive from finance <laughs> is the breadth of the types of capital involved. So it's, it certainly includes philanthropy and grant capital, money that's effectively given away to buy an impact, but goes right across the spectrum of different types of risk and return profiles towards investments that can make an attractive return but entirely focused on impact too. So the, the range of, of types of finance in this space, I think is far broader than, than in the mainstream markets and offers you know, really extraordinary opportunities for innovation um, in practice, but also great and challenging intellectual um, projects to research and teach this stuff. So, so I'd like to, from my point of view, present social finance as a you know, disruptive innovation. I think that, I hope, is an attractive thing to study with us. Uh, we consider innovation and disruption across lots of parts of the business school, not just in finance, but this is the focus of my conversation here. And the research you see in front of you, the, the three books that have um, been published by myself and colleagues at the business school over the last couple of years, I think represent you know, a significant body of research that we've done with colleagues in this space, trying to understand, for example, how you price a social finance investment, uh, given that it's not just possible to assess it in, from standard you know, financial metrics because it has a blended value. Or we've begun to consider how risk and return models may have to be recalibrated to take account of capital that drives impact as well as potentially financial return. So we've been spending more than a decade uh, writing and publishing uh, around this emergent space. And I do think it's fair to say that if you look across the world, we have as deeper research tradition and background in this space as anybody else in the world, if not superior. So that's something we really enjoy tapping into to, to talk to our, our students and colleagues when they come to Oxford. Perfect. And, I, and I, I thank you very much. I think that, again, from my perspective, um, is that how do we take those solutions to scale? This course, unlike impact investing, and we'll talk about the distinction somewhat uh, later on, is, is again, big resources, stacking capital in creative ways, building those unique partnerships, because money and negotiation all need to flow together to create those, so to take, tackle the most dramatic changes and challenges that we face globally. So social finance for me is, again, packaging finance in a way that will attack and tackle and find solutions to, again, those intractable issues, climate change, um, 
inequality in, in education and wealth. And how do we do that creatively with, um, with the students who join us, coupling pra practice, research, and innovation and disruption in a classroom? Um, that's what we're going to talk about in terms of your learning journey. Next slide. So again, this investment spectrum, the social finance, and Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you again, but, but, to, but to say that, that our class will look at um, social finance from philanthropy to corporations and all points in between, and how one blends those resources together to create social change. Alex, do you want to ha add anything to this slide? Uh, well, sure. Just to say, I think, again, this um, it, it is a complicated slide, but it, essentially, if you can imagine on the left having capital that's, that's, that's only really concerned with creating social value but makes no financial return, so that's grant making, and on the far right-hand side, you'll have capital which is looking to make impact but also is looking to make at least market returns to... Um, to the, the owners of capital, then you've got a spectrum that runs between those two extremes. Um, and as you might imagine, some of this, these, these types of deals and capital flows and instruments you know, are very um, unusual for people who are used to uh, the conventions of finance. Um, and that offers a huge, I think, an interesting opportunity to, to learn and explore because what we see is that investor behavior across the spectrum doesn't conform to a very narrow assumption about what investors want, which is to maximize their risk-adjusted returns, right? So we can see in practice this extraordinarily interesting human behavior when it comes to money with respect to impact. And I think part of the spectrum set out this way is to let us realize this big variety of, of interest in different, different uh, kind of purposes of capital. And as you say, once you break it up into a spectrum, you can then also play interesting games with combining different types of capital to create uh, different deal structures and fund structures. So it's a, it's a useful kind of, kind of diagram, I think, just to orient us around the, the great variety of, of interesting cases and investments that we'll look at in the program and also uh, to how we might combine them to try to have real, as Gail says, kind of systemic impact, impact which is difficult to find in narrow silos of, of the market. Um, so that I think is a value of this and of this picture and I think also kind of signposts the, the diversity of the, the program we're going to teach. I mean, if you will, my friend, I say this one thing, my friend Jed Emerson, you know, sort of created this simple idea many years ago and he talked about impact investing and social finance. And he said, if you imagine, you know, the spectrum of, of capital to, to be that similar to that of electromagnetic energy, then mainstream markets are simply visible light. There's sim simply a tiny sliver of the available electromagnetic spectrum of capital. Um, but they're the one that we're obsessed about. They're the ones that we see because it's visible light. Actually, what social finance tries to do is, says, is say, imagine the whole spectrum. Imagine the equivalent of radio waves and x-rays and microwaves and, uh, and so forth. You know, that total spectrum is what we play with in this work we do and in this course, not just that tiny narrow band of visible line. I think that's a wonderful way of describing it. Peter, let's talk a little bit about your experience working on the spectrum. Um, you've talked about Commonwealth as a nonprofit and, and a social entrepreneur as enterprise, but you've also talked about traditional finance. Talk about your experience working across the spectrum. Sure. Um, one of the things that you'll come to know about Oxford is that you can never get two people in a room to get fewer than three opinions. So I respectfully disagree a bit with my colleagues in response. So part of the research that I do also looks at history. And if you look at the long history of how it is that big social projects were financed, um, it is the case that it doesn't necessarily look like what's going on today. But there has, for out, throughout history, been ways that the spectrum that Alex was talking about was more or less visible. Uh, the creation of much of Western society what did not happen because of either the city or Wall Street. It was a set of other institutions. And, you know, if you look at, for example, and this will tie back to my research, how was it that we explored the, the you know, the kind of what ended up being North America, not Columbus, but a little bit after that? It turns out that we, you know, there's public-private 
enterprises that were created, and they used some pretty interesting financing vehicles. One of them was called the, the Million Adventure, um, and the Million Adventure was a really interesting funding vehicle, and it went like this. It said, okay, you know, you put your money in this bond, basically. It will go off, and it will, um, you know, try to explore the new world, and by the way, in addition to getting a little bit of interest, a few people who are the bondholders might win very large lottery-like payouts from this bond. That's 1694. Um, so my research, for example, and the work that we do at Commonwealth, looks at how various structures that, you know, and again, I, I do want to echo what Alex has said, don't necessarily look like the kinds of things that we see today, but which can be, you know, refashioned in order to find new ways to either move capital around or help people to save. So that 1694 innovation, if you're from the UK, you'd recognize it in principle at least as something called premium bonds here in the UK. And if you were in South Africa for a while, you would have recognized it in something called a million a month account, but that was closed down by the government. And if you're in the United States, you'd recognize it in a Walmart set prize savings product, which we've helped to develop, or at least the, our thinking has helped to inform uh, in the work that we do at Commonwealth. So um, I would agree that we need to deploy new kinds we, we need to deploy ever-increasing assets to deal with seemingly ever-larger problems. Um, I would agree that traditional financing vehicles, as normally studied in business schools, um, have a certain apparent narrow remit. But, you know, with my historic hat on, what I note is that what we're seeing here is the kind of normal process of financial innovation. Um, and, and I have written about and I kind of do study, which is that throughout society, if, if you look at various periods, when there are needs for these functions to be delivered, in this case, the funding of, of, of kind of big thorny problems, um, that the innovators of their time have come up with new products to do that. And this is our generation's uh, attempt to do precisely that. Um, so, you know, it's, we're not doing the million adventure in 1694 in order to explore a land that, you know, lies beyond our imagination. What we're doing is that we're trying to come up with funding vehicles in order to explore, if not explore, at least address issues like climate change and others, which are equally kind of outside of most people's day-to-day -day life and imagination, but just as important. So sorry for kind of going on there a little bit, but putting, putting this investment spectrum and social finance into historical perspective, and I hope that we can do a little bit of that in the program at least, um, it's useful to kind of see it as, as I said, this generation's way of dealing with the capital allocation problems uh, for the biggest problems that are bigger than a company, bigger than a country, um, and, and therefore require massive amounts of resources. And I think the other piece of it is that we've talked extensively about finance. What what does it require to actually build the leadership capacity to flow across the spectrum? What kind of alignment has to take place as we're building trust, whether in philanthropy or social enterprise or or World Bank? How do we begin to create lasting relationships based on trust that will allow that capital flow to have impact on the greatest social challenges of our time. So when we look at this spectrum, there's the, the interstitial tissue of leadership, organization, social change, performance measures that are not shown here, but the, the, the building blocks unite and to create those effective deals. So we look at all aspects across this spectrum on how to create effective, lasting social change using the capital, human, social, environmental, um, that is, uh, can be united to actually make a difference. So I, I wanna make sure that we think about the spectrums that the boxes actually blend in, on, in another context. So next slide, please. So we constantly get this question, what's the difference between social finance and, social, and impact investing? And uh, what will I get if I go to social finance versus impact investing? <clears throat> Alex, I'm gonna let you go first. Uh, Peter, you can follow and then I've got my own perspectives. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's pretty well laid out on this slide, I think, so I don't wanna just read it out. But uh, I think uh, the, the chronology of this is of course that we, have developed an impact investing program successfully over the last five years. 
uh, and run it over five cohorts. And what we have learned during that process is that um, there is a need to differentiate, I think, between uh, a close focus on the uh, investments for social impact, which can and do provide a return to investors and the wider spectrum we're describing today. And so the, the first differentiation between these two courses is that the impact investing course confine, can, confines itself to um, investments made in organizations that aim to create social and environmental value and uh, from which the investor will get their money back and a return. So this is a broad definition of impact investing more generally, the kind of thing that the Global Impact Investing Network have endorsed over the last 10 years. Um, and we have organized that program around a series of deep dives into specific deals. So the, the feel of the program is very gritty, uh, I suppose, quite technical, <laughs> detailed, and um, uh, deal driven, an enterprise kind of level, as it says on the slide. And what we realized was that a complementary course to that would be one that is much perhaps more macro in its focus. So it's, it's um, as Gail was saying, and Peter was mentioning, exploring how capital can be deployed to, uh, to address major systemic problems globally. So the level of analysis, I suppose, is more with the problem, the enterprise. Um, and as a consequence, we're looking at this blended spectrum. So we're trying to understand how the full uh, arsenal, if you will, of different types of capital that we might have at our disposal can be deployed to try to tackle and, as it were, to complete the analogy to shoot down these big problems. So, um, so there's a distinction in terms of kind of the level of analysis probably across these two courses, but also in terms of the, uh, the, um, the, the very broad approach from social finance in terms of types of capital and the much more focused, deal-driven uh, impact investing uh, course uh, structure and feel. So I think we're trying to differentiate quite strongly. And now, of course, there'll be uh, there'll be some points of contact between the two programs inevitably, and that's a good thing. We wouldn't be doing our students a service if we went through the whole of the social finance program without mentioning impact investing. It'll it'll of course be there in the DNA of the program, but the uh, the kind of structure, the pedagogy, and the overall. Um, objectives of programs, I think, are are quite distinctive, if complementary. I don't know. Hopefully, that makes sense. No, that's great. And uh, uh, Peter, anything else to add? No, I think you know you and Alex are are really leading the course. From my perspective, you know, I, I'm a very simple-minded guy. I think of four fun functions that financial systems do. They move mo money around today. They move money from today to tomorrow. They move money from tomorrow to today, and they manage risk. Um, so. Social finance and impact investing are both, you know, under this kind of same function, as it were. I think Alex has done a good job in describing, you know, both the scale and scope differentiators between the two courses. I think that's great. I mean, I think it's important to understand where social finance, uh, in addition to having a robust research agenda and platform at the school, we also asked our students from impact investing. Um, who are part of our community, what they wanted to see as this program evolves. Social finance was what they asked for. And the reason they asked for it is they really wanted to understand, they wanted us to help create a program where they could come and get experience and blended capital. How do you build these large scale deals, um, whether they're in, in on climate change in Canada, whether they're in sustainable cities in Beijing, um, whether they're in ensuring quality education in India. How do we blend capital? How do we build those relationships to take on that, uh, the large scale challenges we face? So with input from our students, we've actually created this social finance program because we believe in that deep commitment to our community and to the global network that we've created. In impact investing, again, as Alex pointed out, we've had five very successful years and educated and, and partnered with more than 225 students from 38 countries, from all sectors, primarily from finance though, but again, moving into that space of broad thinking, what do we need to empower and grow our, our community to be more successful in tackling those challenges? So again, our goal is to listen, to build from what our community says and need, its needs, 
and to provide that as an opportunity for continued learning. Next slide. So who will be teaching? And again, I think the, the platform that we've chosen to take for this program is really blending um, academic uh, rigor and uh, new disruptive innovation, uh, as well as coupling that with case studies and uh, learning platform with practitioners. Um, these are a few of our colleagues who will join us. Um, Emmett Carson with Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Uh, his, uh, he is, he's the largest, he oversees the largest community foundation in the world with um, nine billion in assets, uh, makes contributions globally and uh, gives, invests 1.3 billion annually. Um, Bruce Lurie from the Ivy Foundation is actually part of a consortium of, of colleagues representing Suncor, Petroleum, um, McConnell Foundation, the Canadian government to really think through a new role for, for Canada and, the com and Commonwealth countries as the changing dynamic of climate change leadership um, with the exit of, of the United States um, from the Paris Accord, what it means in North America for Canada and the world, and what are the connections with Canada, Germany, um, China in terms of being a leader in climate change? How do you need to reimagine leadership and the flow of capital? Um, Rip Rapson, who's the CEO of Kresge Foundation, uh, is working with colleagues in, in Asia to look at both the dynamic of cities that are being decimated in the Rust Belt in the United States, Detroit specifically has been bankrupt, gone through bankruptcy, has lost 240,000 people in four years, five years, 10 years. Um, and uh, at the same time, you've got Beijing that's driving 200, almost 243 million into cities. So how do we find that, those very different solutions when it comes to creating um, sustainable cities? Uh, Daniel Lee uh, from Levi Strauss Company and Foundation is really looking at how do you change a $3 trillion apparel industry to be concerned about um, worker well-being. That includes financing, creative financing from IFC, um, local social entrepreneurships uh, are being created within companies. Um, so it's, again, how do you create systems change to improve the uh, worker well-being while also using creative finance tools to reshape an entire sector? Um, Alex, you know, um, you know, Jonathan, I'll let you talk about the academic faculty. Faye Tworsky, who's the head of uh, Hewlett Foundation's um, uh, organizational effectiveness, is really we're doing a, a series on feedback loops and performance measures. Um, Alex, you want to talk about the other faculty in terms of academics who will be joining us? Yeah, sure. So, um, so my colleague, Jonathan Mickey from Kellogg College in the University of Oxford, uh, is a global expert on co-op and mutual finance uh, and really I think to uh, much to his surprise to agree with Peter in his earlier comment about history um, I completely agree that uh, to some degree there's nothing new under the sun and I think what uh, what Jonathan will help us understand is how the traditions of you know community mutual and cooperative finance of course go back the best part of 200 years in the UK and probably informally a long time before then so he'll be bringing some of that knowledge, but he'll also be talking specifically um, in the spirit of, of our social finance course being problem driven. He will uh, he will talk to his new book and new research he's been doing on globalization. Uh, he's produced a really fascinating and insightful critical account of how to some degree we've had the wrong kind of globalization over the last 20 years. Not the globalization is bad but the, in itself, but we've perhaps had the wrong form. So he'll be talking about some of that work and also his work on co-op and mutual finance, I think, to show us how we might reimagine aspects of the global economy from a more mutual perspective. So I think that's going to be a fascinating kind of discussion and masterclass. Um, in terms of uh, Karim Haji, Karim is, a, is both a, a seasoned professional in impact measurement and uh, management globally. Uh, and has engaged with a variety of clients as well as being involved in a number of global initiatives to improve the quality of impact measurement 
uh, resources and methods around the world. Uh, he's also a uh, doctoral student part-time at the University of Oxford, so he's doing his own specific line of research, looking at the nature and relationship of impact, measurement and investment. So he'll be drawing on that, um, but also on his deep experience of, uh, of many cases around the world of successful but also unsuccessful impact measurement. And he and I will be working on those themes with you all. Uh, Mark Campanali is a good friend and uh, a, a former financier who's also had a deep experience of activism and over the last 10 years has been very prominent in, in the environmental finance world. Uh, and his more recent work has been with the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which is, uh, as some of you will know, a, uh, a very um, data-driven attempt to, to change the conversation concerning the valuation of carbon-heavy uh, companies, particularly energy companies. So it's trying to use the analytics and techniques of financial analysis and stock analysis to reveal very different uh, perspectives on the the future viability of, of the companies that are likely to add the most carbon to our planet over the next 20 years. So, um, so again, this will be a chance for us to explore how, you know, approaches from finance and how uh, the rigor of financial analysis can actually be deployed in a very different way than it conventionally is, which is to seek out, you know, the highest returns, risk adjusted, and instead be deployed to, um, to a, an environmental end to make strong arguments for uh, divesting and reducing carbon emissions. So, uh, and there'll be others, I have to say, that this is not the full complement of our, of our colleague, the two or three other people we're just finalizing now that we think will add a great deal to the program too. Right, and again, I think it's really important that all the faculty will represent a global perspective. Um, uh, Asia, uh, Africa, Latin America, um, West Europe, um, and again, we've got uh, colleagues from, from Russia coming um, who will be talking about endowments. So uh, rich uh, opportunity to learn from uh, global leaders from very different perspectives. Next slide, please. So I, I want to I quickly go through um, just some images that uh, will highlight the kinds of things that you'll be learning. Um, and, and we'll go through these quickly because we want to get to your questions. But, uh, but, the, but again, putting the person and planet at the core of our, our investment strategies is really important. How do we not forget the people whose lives we're trying to change or improve? So with that, um, when we think about creating, what are you gonna learn? Create large scale blended capital deals, um, improving the lives of, of children and, and the most vulnerable in the world is a part of that. How do you bring together those thought leadership, knowledge, and financial resources to actually create change? That's, um, and, and we hope you have the courage to join us to do that. Next slide, please. Um, defining measurement tools through feedback loops and as, as Alex had mentioned, performance measures. How do you know you're having an impact? Both numbers and nuance of, of change. So we're going to be, that will be incorporated into every uh, aspect of what we do. Um, next slide, please. Building adaptive organizations. The world changes and as we're creating opportunities for finance to blend creativity around social justice, social change issues. We have to build adoptive organiz adaptive organizations who can go with the flow um, with the changes, political, economic, that um, will allow as you're negotiating with people with their very different goals and, and, and ways of doing business, how you can adapt to incorporate and remain aligned as you're moving through this change process. Next slide, please on creative ways of unlocking capital, human capital, environmental, social capital, financial capital to actually create change. Um, next slide. And, and again, the idea of technology and technology entrepreneurs are coming together around the world, whether Jack Ma, um, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the, the fact is they're redefining how we use and view big data and capital. So we'll get, we're gonna spend time through a case study looking at technology values and change um, driven by 
uh, .com, successful .com entrepreneurs. Um, we're going to quickly go through that, and I'm going to have Alex and Peter then also uh, give us their insights and thoughts. We'll have a case study on financing for sustainable cities, both in the United States and Asia. Next slide. Climate change strategies. Again, with the, with the changes in leadership in the world, um, how do we build and unite new strategies and opportunities for finance for low carbon economies um, globally? Next slide. Um, uh, worker well being in the supply chain. Um, how do we use a large scale uh, capital, whether it's corporate, whether it's public sector? Um, or whether it's uh, on the ground social enterprise and social investing to actually make a difference in the textile industry and apparel industry. Next slide. And each of these will have cases. Um, Alex and Peter, do you want to add anything to some of the topics that we're going to go into? Any uh, based on your experiences? Um, we'll again use a case study format where students will come together from different disciplines really grappling with issues not only the, uh, the challenges that faced those social investors, but also what remains as they struggle to navigate those really complex environments using finance as a tool. Anything you want to add in terms of content um, areas or your reaction to that? Well, I, thought we might, I would just say I hope people can see this is a, you know, a challenging agenda. We're going to we're going to try to dive in on some really significant and complicated issues. And I think part of our job is to try to uh, reveal some of that complexity and the, some of the difficulties of resolving big problems, and then begin to piece together some solutions. So it's going to be a you know a process of really understanding you know the the multi-dimensional nature of these big problems, and then finding where social finance can you know, can have a kind of leverage value at what point, you know, is the finance and investment model um, going to have the most effective impact to help tip some of these problems into a more positive mode. So, uh, you know, it's not that we will necessarily give you a whole bunch of neat solutions, but we will endeavor to work with you to try to unpack problems in ways that might help us move towards solutions from a social finance kind of perspective. Peter, any thoughts? Yeah, um, so before I was giving the timeless perspective of history, um, I think w this space that we're talking about for this particular course in social finance is still a nascent and emerging space. So therefore, uh, I think participants should expect that the case studies that they see, the individuals who come and speak frankly about what they're learning, should should acknowledge that you know not everything's going to be working perfectly. Part of the learning process, the learning journey, when you look at real live cases with real live organizations is to acknowledge the parts that are working, the parts that are not working, and then to kind of to evolve both their approach and our approach to make that work. There's actually a theory that sits behind this. You know, my, my former colleague had written about the innovation spiral, and the whole point of the innovation spiral is to look at innovations that have failed and succeeded and you can learn as much from the failed ones because we tweet, we basically you know, work off the failed ones in order to figure out how to make them better. So in the spirit that Alex said, don't expect you're going to get all the answers, um, what you should expect, I hope to get from this, is a set of the right questions. Um, see how real people are you know, struggling in order to direct finance, social finance in the right ways. You know, have the right metrics, the right organizational structures, the right alignment, as, as Gail pointed out, and to come away from the class, not only from their experience, but from the experience of others in the class, in, you know, kind of moving the discussion and, and the discussion and the field forward. Well, and again, I think that all of these cases will be about the unanswered and the failures and, and honest reflection and challenges. So, so it's really rolling up your sleeves and getting to work when you come because there are no, uh, there's no silver bullet. And, and because these are complex issues, what we're doing with the social finance course, which is, which is different from impact investing, is we're helping our students immerse themselves in the issues before the program. There's an online learning uh, study guide uh, case homework assignments, there's a network exchange uh, that we're going to be using that will um, advance introductions, uh, pair students around their, their interests, 
Um, we're also launching a CEO social finance leadership series or circle, um, which allows uh, CEOs in the field to talk very specifically and candidly about their insights, about their challenges that they face. And, um, and so that's going to be launching um, very soon, if not, if not this week. Um, the, the program, again, will blend cutting edge research grounded in experiential learning through cases um, and, and really help us uh, um, work with our, our student partners to understand how effective strategies for blending capital to address those tough issues of, of climate change, sustainable cities, um, technologies used to advance uh, what scaled solutions are, recognizing that scale doesn't necessarily mean everything that works in Mumbai is going to work in Memphis um, or Moscow. So understanding the context of what we're doing, why it's important, but it's really, um, and, and our students will come away too with a strategy for, for themselves and how they can move forward. Um, anything else, Let, let's go to the next slide. And I know, I know we want to see if there's any questions. Uh, Brad, if there's anything. Um, highlights, we'll go really quickly. Bring curiosity and discovery to our program. Next, next uh, slide. Uh, be prepared to deal with complex systemic solutions. Next slide. Take courageous actions. We all, uh, I just want to let you know that we'll all do yoga every day. I'm joking. But we, we want to ultimately look like this woman who's, uh, who's, who's quite adaptive and, and flexible. So be prepared for courageous actions. Next slide. And leave with a strategy for you. Again, we're using an online platform that will allow you to create a learning platform when you leave that you can take back with you. Next slide. This is what our, 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 our goal is to make sure that you understand and work within the community. Um, uh, push those buttons, Brad. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That really shows you the network that we've established thanks to our students in impact investing. Um, you can see where our students come from, um, that the, it's very diverse. And um, and we're populating by the past five years. We'll do it really quickly. There you go. So th this is our community of practice, and, and we welcome you to our community of practice. Um, next slide. Um, so in summary, uh, what we what we want to uh, bring to you uh, is the is the goal to to combine the tackling of large-scale problems with leading academic research, with world leaders giving cases and have a plan for you. And, and to actually engage with a global peer group, it's ambitious. And I guess as a as program director, I wanna challenge you, do you have the courage to come and prepare with us to tackle some of the world's biggest problems and take those solutions to scale? We would welcome the opportunity to have you join us. Um, any questions yeah. um, from the audience, Brad, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, I've got the first question, which is directed at Alex. Um, the gen says, hi, Alex. I wonder how you think mainstream investors will switch to, I guess, a completely new way of investing? Um, the gen says, my experience from raising an impact-focused private equity fund of funds has taught me that 99% of investors want conventional instruments with commercial returns or close to it? Yes, well, I, I think it's um, it's entirely right to say that, and I think that reflects the, the status quo we currently find in the world. However, I think what we do see, and I don't know if this has been reflected in the practice of, uh, of the questioner, but it sounds like it might have been, is that there are commercial reasons for beginning to understand and engage with social finance and impact investing and those include um, you know defensive strategies so people I think are realizing that um, deploying capital for impact may actually uh, offset risks in other parts of your portfolio or in, in itself may also be less risky um, because of the potential to avoid for example the carbon disasters that we've uh, we've mentioned already 
And I think there are also positive reasons to engage with some of these impact sectors for the mainstream, which would include the fact that some of these impact investments uh, are clearly in growth markets, markets where social investors are discovering um, commercial opportunities ahead of the mainstream markets. Uh, and of course, microfinance was the, uh, is the kind of poster boy example of that, you know, a, um, uh, a new type of market that was entirely uh, discovered by effectively originally kind of philanthropic capital, but now is a mainstream uh, financial sector for most of the big banks uh, to engage in. So I think it's true to say that um, for the majority of investors, investing for impact is only going to be of interest in its financial context. But I think there are in, you know, a set of arguments emerging for, um, for engaging your, your capital with impact for financial reasons. And then, of course, there will be a whole other universe of investors who are not driven solely by return and for whom a blended return of, of impact plus finance is entirely attractive. And uh, we have plenty of case evidence, you know, probably at least $300 billion of assets under management right now in impact investing globally, um, and uh, probably in advance of $20 trillion in socially responsible investing globally that demonstrate investors do have an appetite for this kind of stuff. So, um, yes, it's true, we're a long way away from kind of getting the 99%, I guess, to engage, but there are, I think, you know, emerging and evidenced arguments to uh, engage the mainstream. Great. Can I just jump in on that? Yeah, so absolutely. two of our colleagues separately have done uh, studies, largely survey studies with institutional investors addressing precisely this question. Uh, and, you know, asking those investors what it will take for them to move a bit. Uh, part of the answer, according to some of those, at least what they people say, investors say, is that they want more data, more information, so that they know that when they do put money into various types of investments, they're actually going to get the outcomes that they that they hope they would. Speaking more anecdotally, I sit on some investment management boards, and I've been pressing some of my organizations to uh, to take into consideration, you know, the impact of our investments. Um, you know, and I I would have to agree with the with the questioner who said, yeah, we're still early days. Uh, making those arguments is still kind of uh, relatively new, despite 300 billion in a multi-trillion dollar euro pound world. Um, so make no doubt about it, we're at the forefront of of this movement, and uh, and coming to the course will help you position yourself to be in that very front end of the wedge, uh, a wedge that, from my perspective, will only have to grow larger and larger, given the size of the problems that the world is facing. Right, thank you very much, Peter. A um, couple of other interesting questions. Uh, a gent asked, recently CPA Australia suggested that the growth of social impact investing is likely to give rise to a sector which serves societal needs but p possesses attributes of the public sector, the private not-for-profit sector, and the private for-profit sector do you agree with the suggestion? So that's the first part of the question. Um, the second question is, does the course explore the growth and emergence of this new sector? And the third question within that would be, would this include the development of governance structures to support the sector and its growth? Yes. I mean, I'd like to answer that, Brad. I mean, the answer is yes. Um, it, it does cut across all of those sectors, in, including private sector. And, and when we think about, for example, um, Mark, from Mark Zuckerberg, uh, $45 billion going to an LLC to, for social change, uh, those days have come. And if, and if we think about um, corporations that are getting involved in, um, in both lending their own capital um, for uh, market-based change, as well as in, in philanthropy and social enterprise, those are very specific illustrations that we're going to draw on. It requires the full spectrum to be engaged. And in addition, we're going to address the issue of governance and alignment of those um, uh, leadership skills that are needed to, um, to blend those very different perspectives to create commonality around change. So the answer is yes. Correct. We will be tackling. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, 
We've got time for a couple of more questions, and we'll go through those. Um, and I know we want to leave you with enough time to talk about um, how to sign up for this remarkable yeah, course. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Great. Um, one last question, Gail, or would you like me to, to go into? Yeah, no, yeah go, go ahead. One last question. I think it's, it's uh, then you can talk about how to, how to enroll. Great. Okay. Uh, the last question I've got is what types of experiential opportunities have students responded to most positively to and taken advantage of? So e.g., whether it be managing an actual fund or consulting for impactful initiatives or, or building blended capital deals for organizations. Alex, do you want to address that? Uh, well, I, I, I'm slightly unsure if the question means within the ambit of the program or, more, you know, kind of after the program or beyond the program. Uh, I mean, you know, within the program, we obviously will have kind of workshop sessions, sessions that allow people to tap into deep knowledge of, of, of practitioners and to, to workshop key questions with experts. So from that point of view, you know, there is a kind of experiential feature to this. But uh, Am I missing the point, Brad? No, no, no. I, th I think that's uh, I, I think that's that's a perfect answer, Alex. I think he was meaning within the remits of what we would cover on the program. Uh, yeah, it's, of... it's, you know, it's the nature of of these kind of programs, which are practical and highly engaging, and the pedagogy and the structure of the courses are designed to encourage discussion and interaction and debate. You know, we we really try to structure these courses to maximize students' opportunity to learn from each other as well as us. So, I mean, that's a, that's a given in the way we try to think about this. And the truth is, you know, lots of experiential learning happens in the pub and in Oxford colleges and, and in, you know, the beautiful quads of, uh, of our, um, our home, home city. So we make sure there's plenty of that too factored into the program. Right, and I also think it's really important that, that those relationships that our students build within the classroom transcend and actually continue beyond the walls of Ox, you know, Oxford University and, and Site Business School to very significant deals that are done um, to address issues, as, as Peter pointed out, in terms of lack of electricity in Africa, to lack of education, uh, girls' education around the world, where our students partner and blend capital based on what they've learned and the relationships they've created. So um, it's a both and. Great. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, I know I'm meant to head over to my business development part of the course, but a couple of interesting questions have emerged about a number of a large number of questions have emerged from uh, potential participants of the scope. So the audience, um, I've got a question asking, hi, who should attend? Is it appropriate for practitioners from the impact investing industry or is it more targeted to practitioners um, in family offices, uh, et cetera? I mean, I think it's all of the above, right? It's, it's when we're thinking about how we package financial deals, wherever those resources come from, and, and, they, and typically our students represent that full spectrum and, that, and what makes this unique is knitting together their interests and skills and resources. So I would say yes, yes, they should come. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Let me just add to that. I mean, we do really endeavor to have diversity in our student group, so we, we try to make sure that we have you know a range of people from different parts of the market and different countries and different sectors as part of a student group because we think that just makes a much richer experience for everybody so we do try to to, to really aim for that kind of diversity in the room thank you alex um and then the last the last suggestion that would be great to i guess discuss before before moving on um i've got two questions that are related one is from an alumni of ours um, saying that so far what we've covered seems to be at, at the macro level um, and he's asked what would people working on the ground in small social finance organizations gain from attending this program and then 
before I let you answer, um, a similar related question uh, from someone else, from from another participant is: um, Will the program also talk about smaller deals, like for example, the work of Fair Finance in the UK, whose potential beneficiaries um, influence four million people? Um, I'll, I'll quickly add that that it's really important when we were looking at those images of people, right? Whether in healthcare clinics or whether um, uh, in, in educational settings, it's about we begin there. And so it, at a village level, how do you aggregate those actions together to create change? So when we think about climate change, we're gonna be looking, for example, at the Aki community, a First Nation Aboriginal community in Manitoba, they play a part in the overarching strategy for climate, climate change agenda and in social finance for the entire country of Canada and commonwealths. So it's micro plus uh, aggregating the micro to make mat macro and not losing sight of the people whose lives we're trying to change. So it's village level plus, right? Um, both at the, at the grass tops and grassroots. Great. Um, is really essential. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, firstly, thank you everybody for participating in today's um, social finance webinar. I want to thank Alex, Gail, and and Peter Tafana, our dean. Um, the the questions we get asked uh, regularly. So the differences between our long-standing successful impact inv investing program and our new social finance program. We've covered that in a number of discussions in today's webinar um, some of the the practicalities around the program so we will be running the program for the first time this november from the 6th to the 10th um, so what are some of the things that you will look to take away or benefit from as a result of taking the program so um, what has worked very, very well on our impact investing program, which, which Alex and Gail mentioned we've been running successfully for the last five years. Um, in total, we've had 247 participants from 63 different countries. Um, and the range of organizations um, and nationalities is much like today's webinar, um, where we have senior level executives from across all seven continents we've had um we've had we've had very senior participants from dutch pension funds we've had those looking to develop out uh impact investing advisory services for private banks um, everybody seems to have a different take or perspective on what they need to use us for. And we believe the social finance program will be exactly in the same manner as our, as our impact investing program. So as, as you can see up on the screen, um, what we do well, um, besides our world-class research, we will work with you to go and develop your own social finance strategy. Um, within that, you'll walk away with a social finance toolkit so as Alex mentioned uh, when discussing the the spectrum of social finance we'll be going into different types of social finance instruments tools um, we have research on layered capital approaches and what that looks like and how that influences hybrid fund structures um, so the course is inherently practical um, but it is driven by Oxford's world-class research agenda um, and as Gail mentioned we will be looking at different types of deals um, and scale uh, is is a big question and how how you go about achieving that scale um, is one of the the focal points of our program so I wanted to say thank you very much for your time um, we look forward to you joining us this November uh, for our our first program and if you would like to contact us to find out more about the program it would be an absolute pleasure to speak with you so thank you very much for your time I really appreciate it and we look forward to meeting a lot of you in person uh, this November so thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your your evening or your day so thank you